Good morning, everyone. And welcome to the 2019 ALS annual meeting, the ALS opening plenary session, the Building Bridges program. If you'll indulge me, I have a few of our formal uh, announcements that we always start these programs with. Um, a CLE attendance sheet is located in the rear of the room. If you sign it, the ALS will verify your attendance at the program for CLE purposes. The ALS can verify your attendance if you sign the sheet, but only if you sign the sheet. Please refer to the sign-in sheet for more details. Uh, we value your feedback, so please complete the session survey found on the AALS um, mobile app. It's wonderful to have you here in New Orleans. I'm Wendy Perdue. I'm the president of the Association of American Law Schools and dean of the University of Richmond School of Law. It's my privilege to welcome all of you, faculty, administrators, deans, and members of the local uh, bench and bar um, for this opening session. The tradition of inviting members of the bench and bar um, means there may be folks in the room who you don't already know. Um, so consistent with my theme of building bridges, I would invite you to take a moment to introduce yourself to the people around you in case there's someone you don't know. <laughs> it's been an enormous honor this year to work with the nine members of the, associ uh, the association's executive committee. Each is thoughtful, extraordinarily well informed, and committed to the best interests of legal education. They work with care and imagination on a variety of issues confronting AALS and legal education. I'd ask my fellow members of the executive committee to rise so that we can thank you for your service. I, I want to thank in particular those who are concluding their service um, at, at, the, at the end of this annual meeting. Immediate past president Paul Marcus from William & Mary, Alicia Alvarez from the University of Michigan Law School, and Vincent Rougeau of Boston College Law School. Thank you very much. It takes the service of a terrific staff and literally hundreds of volunteers to put on the annual meeting of this size and complexity. I want to extend a particular thanks to AALS Program uh, Committee, which was wonderfully chaired by Dean Kathleen Buzang of the Seton Hall University School of Law. As you'll see from the program, the annual meeting is a feat of tremendous collaboration, spanning the work of six committees. If the members of the following committees would please rise to be recognized so that we can thank them. The uh, program committee of the annual meeting, the, the Arc of Career Program Committee, the Committee to Review Scholarly Papers for the 2019 Annual Meeting, the 2019 Dean's Forum Program Committee, the 2019 Workshop for Pre-Tenured law, law School Teachers of Color, and the Committee on Institutional Advancement. Thank you all. I'd like to thank the chairs of the 103 sections who've worked hard to put on the programs today. Um, I, I'd, I'd ask that all the section chairs also stand to be recognized and thanks. Good teaching matters to us, to our students, and to our future clients. Recogn recognition of excellence in teaching is one of the ways we reinforce the important academic values. The teachers who were recognized by their schools during the 2017-2018 year for outstanding teacher teaching are listed in the opening plenary program. Would the teachers of the year please rise so that we can recognize your outstanding service. I hope you'll all take a moment to review the names, and if you have an opportunity to, to see the, those colleagues uh, over the course of the meeting, uh, congratulate them. During my years in the Legal Academy, I've, I've witnessed the positive impact that our teaching, scholarship, and service have on our students, our local communities, and the broader society. What we do matters, so it matters that we do it well. The lawyers that we're educating today are the next generation of leaders, innovators, and problem solvers, solvers and will need every bit of their judgment, creativity, empathy, and insight 
as they navigate the increasingly fractured and complex world that we're leaving for them. As you know, my theme for this year's meeting is building bridges. I wanted to highlight that lawyers and law schools can play a role as our society struggles with the growing polarization and tribal hostility of our political and social lives. And I wanted to encourage all of us to examine ways that we can build bridges. We have uh, several presidential programs uh, today and tomorrow that reflect this theme. Later this morning, we have a fabulous panel discussion on law and reconciliation. Tomorrow afternoon, uh, we have a panel discussion among a group of former elected officials uh, discussing ways to bridge the divide in politics. But we lead off this morning with a keynote address from one of the exceptional bridge builders in the world. Justice Edwin Cameron of the Constitutional Court of South Africa. Now sometimes when you hear a uh, biography, an introduction of a speaker, uh, and the components of that person's past, you think, ah yes, it's, it's so obvious, it's, it's so inevitable that they would have ended up in their current position. And for Justice Cameron, there are aspects of his life that fall into that category. He was a Rhodes Scholar, studied at Oxford, graduated at the top of his law school class, University of South Africa. He was on the governing council of the University of Witterstrand. He joined the judiciary in 1994, was recommended to the Constitutional Court for the first time in 1999, and ultimately appointed to the court in uh, 2009. He's published two books, has been honored around the world uh, with numerous awards, including the Nelson Mandela Award for Health and Human Rights. It sounds so obvious that he would end up where he is. But there are other aspects of Justice Cameron's life that make one pause and reflect on how unlikely his current position would have seemed at earlier times. And as a result, what an exceptional man he is. As he tells it in his autobiography, his first encounter with the law was at the age of seven, when he was home briefly from his stay at an orphanage in Queenstown to attend the funeral of his older sister who'd been killed in a biking accident. There he saw uniformed prison guards who accompanied his father. He later came to understand that his father was not off at a rehabilitation hospital, but was in prison for auto theft. He has said of that experience, it led him to wonder whether the law was only an instrument of rebuke and correction, or could it be more? After graduating from law school, he became a human rights lawyer and activist. He defended ANC fighters charged with, reason, uh, with treason and uh, protested forced removals. At one point, the president of the Johannesburg Bar recommended that he be disciplined for his outspoken criticism of the judiciary. He's openly gay and worked hard to promote gay and lesbian rights. In 1999, after having been recommended for the Constitutional Court and at the hearing on his nomination, he publicly announced that he was HIV positive with AIDS. This was a time of enormous fear about AIDS. And he went on to publicly criticize President Mbeki's AIDS denial stance. Now you might pause and reflect on that list and think as you are advising your students about the path to the highest court in the land, would any of those things be on the list? Certainly not in this country. Justice Cameron embodies so much of what we aspire to for our profession and for the judiciary. Courage, passionate commitment to justice, empathy, an understanding of human frailty combined with the belief that progress is possible. So friends, it is my great honor to introduce to you Justice Cameron. Friends, colleagues, good morning. That's very African. How are you? 
That's less African. How are you? Thank you very much. Wendy, thank you for those thoughtful and tender and extremely generous words. I, I treasure them. And thank you to all of you for coming here this morning. Uh, it's a great honor for me to be here. And I must start by telling you that yesterday on the flight from Atlanta, I sat next to a man from Oklahoma who was coming to New Orleans after 24 years in the Navy to do work on the seabed. His name was Clinton. We fell into a warm conversation in the course of which he asked me a question. He said, why are you coming here to talk to American lawyers? It's a very good question. I tried to answer it. I said to him that my country's journey in law has been an arresting and challenging one in ways that I hope will engage you. Let me tell you how I hope to do this in the next 30 minutes. This young student volunteer here has promised to get up boldly after 30 minutes and wave a placard right in my face. Please do that so that Wendy and I have a lot of time for a conversation and that you have time for your questions because those are perhaps the most important part. I'm going to I have an introduction about South Africa's transformation from a racial autocracy, a cruel racial autocracy, to a constitutional democracy. Then I'll tell you three stories. The one is about AIDS that Wendy has previewed. The second is about governmental transition uh, under extreme circumstances, where I contrast what happened in Zimbabwe at the end of 1917 with what, uh, 2017 with what happened in my country last year. And the third story is less about legal mechanisms than about the impact of law on the public. And there, I tell a story about the impact on the public in South Africa of LGBTI rights. The theme I take from those three stories is about the diverse ways in which the law has authority in which judges can properly exercise it, and in which they should properly exercise it. Then my last section, all in 30 minutes, is to draw three lessons, not for you. I will not patronize you or condescend to you. Lessons that I make for myself about my engagement as an anti-apartheid lawyer and then as a judge in South Africa for 25 years. We are a young democracy not quite a quarter century old. And the last 25 years have been searing. Years of debate, contestation, amidst the specter of disintegrating conflict. We began our journey from oppression in 1990, when Nelson Mandela was released from prison after 27 years. After four years of perilous negotiations, we became a constitutional democracy. At this very time, April 1994, 2,700 kilometers to the north, Rwanda was in thrall to a bloody genocide. Every day for 90 days, 10,000 people were murdered. Not with the industrial efficiency that people like me, white people, perfected in Europe 50 years before, but in handheld combat in their own communities, their own congregations, their own workplaces and cities. Apartheid did not inflict bloodshed and death of this kind, or on this scale. The damage it wrought was different, and in certain precise ways, perhaps more lastingly injurious. Apartheid was designed to systematize the conviction that black people were inferior just because of their skin culture. It denied the majority of our country the right to vote, to live where they would or could, to marry whom they chose, to move around freely, to meet, to organize, to assemble, to express themselves as human and political beings. In short, it systematically stripped people on the basis of their skin color, of their civic status, in ways calculated to make them seem and feel less than human. None of this, friends, colleagues, will seem novel to you. What was distinctive about apartheid was the extent to which it was minutely regulated through law, 
the white settlers of 1652 brought with them the Roman Dutch law, grounded in the 12 tables of the Roman law. They were immensely proud of its elegances and its sophistications. And all of this was put to subordinate, to denigrate, to suppress and oppress on the premise of racial lessness. Apartheid inflicted gigantic injustices, personal, communal and social. The civil and foreign wars it unleashed to sustain itself were brutal and bloody. The material privileges that apartheid secured for white people like me, someone who grew up, as Wendy has said, in a poor and dysfunctional home, but who made it through a whites-only school to a whites-only university where I got the Rhodes Scholarship. The material privileges were enormous, and the consequent and commensurate deprivations it inflicted on the majority of our people live on in a present state of dispossession and inequality. Yet, it is in the shameful stigma of racial subordination that apartheid's sting most distinctively endures. How then, and this is the question from the introduction to my talk, at the very time that Rwanda was undergoing a bloody genocide, did South Africa move into constitutional democracy? The primary answer lies in the mass struggle for liberation that the South African people themselves fought in the townships, in the streets, in the cities, and in the rural areas. Yet there was something special about that struggle. It had lawyers on its side. This is my main theme this morning. The second component of South Africa's liberation lay in the unflagging principled courage of lawyers, men and women who saw the apartheid system as an aberration, a perversion of the law, rather than in its proper attainment. Nelson Mandela, his law partner Oliver Tambo, they were two justly famous lawyers who fought to secure justice under law, even as the space for it became more and more suffocatingly occluded. My own mentors, including Arthur Chaskelson, Sidney Kentridge, George Bezos, John Dugard, they held out a vision of law that repudiated the uses to which apartheid put it. In their vision, the enforcement through law of inferiority and exclusion were aberrant. Their lives and work were built on a nobler premise that the purpose of the law was to dignify those subject to it and to create the conditions in which all could equally flourish. To this end, they relentlessly employed the laws and the courts of apartheid law itself, the very refinements and edifices of apartheid law, to resist the increasing degradations that it inflicted. Amidst many disheartening failures, they attained enormous successes. The pass laws, if you were an adult black person in most of the country, more than 80% of the country, you had to have a pass, a degrading document that required you to show that you had permission to be outside what were called the homeland areas. Those laws were brought to a juddering halt in the early 1980s by two decisions of five white Afrikaner men in apartheid's appeal court. Highly technical decisions in which the logic of the law was recognized. Perhaps more importantly even, was the growth of a strongly organized black workforce. In 1979, the apartheid government realized that its prohibition on black people even joining or forming trade unions was unsustainable. Apartheid's opponents saw the promising opportunities that black trade unionism offered. They seized it. They worked through the apartheid courts, using the maze of apartheid labor laws to strengthen workers to create the fastest growing union force anywhere in the world. One of the leaders is now South Africa's president, an impressive man called Cyril Ramaphosa. All this meant two things. First, when Mandela was released in February 1990, there was a strong cadre of experienced lawyers, lawyers committed to the notion of law as an instrument of justice and dignity and equality. As important, there was an, a widespread but, but 
deeply held conviction amongst many of South Africa's people that the law could be more than an instrument of, inju of injustice. If properly adapted, its enlistment for the evil ends of apartheid could be transformed into something else. The result was South Africa's constitution, which your own Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg has praised as a model for constitution makers in preference to your own. I had to say that, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Amongst its founding values, our constitution fixes the supremacy of the rule of law. At its heart is the commitment to dignity for all. It requires open, accountable, and transparent government for all. And now we come to the three stories I want to tell. The first is about AIDS, which Wendy has already mentioned. In seeking to overcome the dispossession that apartheid inflicted, our constitution goes further than yours, further than the traditional first order rights. In doing so, it recognizes a pivotal human truth, that it is no use to confer upon humans rights to free speech, association, conscience, belief, religion, movement, unless you ensure that their material circumstances enable them in some meaningful way to enjoy those rights. In this, we differ brightly from your own constitution, of which Chief Justice Rehnquist famously said, it is not a guarantee of certain minimum levels of safety and security, but a limitation on the state's power to act. This to a South African, after 350 years of racial injustice, is a sharply constricted conception of constitutionalism. Its primary objective is to negate despotism by limiting the powers of government. It is alien to us because the logic of our constitution makers was clear. For over three centuries, white people used the law to divide, oppress, humiliate, and exclude. They did so with great efficacy. Coordinately, the law should now be used to undo the deep vestiges of racial privilege which apartheid secured. Therefore, the Constitution enshrines entitlements to social and economic goods. The most important of these, for my first story this morning, is the right of access to health care. Just as we became a democracy, AIDS hit our country with terrific force. The first people affected by it were people like myself, young white men, young gay men or men having sex with men, often in professional positions, very much like the men on your east and west coasts and your midwest who died in the hundreds of thousands during the 1980s. But by the mid-1980s, it became very clear that the trajectory of the epidemic in Africa would be radically different. It would affect black people, black heterosexuals, poor black heterosexuals, people stigmatized by centuries of European colon colon colonial exploitation. Two shames came together, the shame of racial stigma and the, the shame of sexual transmission. When President Mbeki took office in 1999, at the end of President Mandela's single term, antiretroviral drugs had just become available. Just as our national death rate from age reached nearly half a million per year, the drugs became accessible to stop the terrible, grievous suffering and loss. This I knew from deep personal experience. I fell ill after 11 years with HIV infection. 11 years, I might say, ladies and gentlemen, of shame. Shame as a gay man for becoming infected with a sexually transmitted virus until I realized that the shame had nothing to do with homosexuality. It was something deeper, because people so different from myself, black women, married to mine workers, women who told me that their only sexual partner had been their husband, felt exactly the, shame, the deep sense of shame and stigma that I'd experienced. When I fell ill more than 20 years ago, I had the salary of a judge to afford the enormous cost in Africa of the antiretroviral drugs. It was the pivotal moment of my adult life, 
from facing certain death within a median survival time of 30 to 36 months, my life was given back to me, and I knew that within two, within two weeks. I could not remain silent, neither about my privilege, nor about the stigma, nor about the necessity of making available to 30 million Africans, poorer than myself, the drugs. President Mbeki thought differently. From the shame of a sexually transmitted epidemic that affected a mass population only on one continent, the world's sole black continent, he refused to accept the etiology of AIDS. He challenged the existence of the virus, he challenged uh, the causality of AIDS, and he challenged, most importantly, the efficacy of antiretroviral treatment. It was a profoundly tragic moment in our national history. At the end of the year in which President Mbeki took office, the death toll was so enormous that it became essential to act. Fortunately, apartheid left us with a tradition of angry, principled activism, the very principled activism that had led black people in my country to rise up against the most powerful government on Africa, the apartheid government. The Treatment Action Campaign, founded by Zaki Ahmed, had been founded to tackle the outrageous prices that the drug companies demanded for antiretroviral treatment. They now had to face the worst nightmare of presidential denialism. Although I held office as a judge, I knew that I had to speak out and to join the campaign to lower prices and to make drugs available. The Treatment Action Campaign exercised every available right that the new Bill of Rights gave them. They took to the streets, they held marches, they waged a massive public information and media campaign. They lobbied government and its opponents. They enlisted churches and the trade unions. When President Mbeki wouldn't budge, they were forced to exercise the most important right of all, the right of access to courts. They asserted that President Mbeki's government had failed to act reasonably, as the Constitution obliged it, to secure the right of access to health care. In a momentous decision, the court of which I later became a member, upheld this contention, ruled against President Mbeki in most dramatic circumstances. It held that his policy was not reasonable. It ordered him to start making antiretroviral treatment available. For some terrible moments, it looked as though President Mbeki and his health minister Dr. Mantu Chabalala M. Simang might not obey the court order. Just to our north, two years before, President Robert Mugabe had, become, had begun a campaign of brutality and lawlessness which hounded the Chief Justice from office and rendered the courts powerless. We held our breath, and President Mbeki bowed his head before the order of the court. After hesitant, halting, and even grudging compliance, we now have the world's most effective and most successful, most widespread, publicly provided antiretroviral treatment program. More than four and a half million people, like myself, receive these drugs cheaply because of the fight of the Treatment Action Campaign and its allies, I might say, on your own continent, together with the Clinton and Gates Foundations, which eventually secured the lower drug prices, that victory was won and also because of the principled angry activism of young, mainly black South Africans who refused to accept an unjust and unreasonable government decree. They were aided by principled, resolute and courageous judges. The decision of the court to order President Mbeki to make drugs available was a victory for people dying of AIDS. But more, it was a victory for reason, and most important, a triumph for the rule of law and for constitutionalism. The decision cemented the power of the Constitution and of reasoned decisions by the courts, exercising the judicial power that the Constitution entrusted to them. That decision has produced a rich harvest, which when I joined the court a few years ago, we were able to exercise. It set up the court as an authoritative and scrupulous check 
on government folly and misrule. This leads to my second story. It's a story of political power and securing transition under it. In the last four years, the courts have become a battleground against governmental corruption and malfeasance. The Constitutional Court has been called upon to adjudicate claims that former President Zuma abused his power. In 2014, accusations that he had spent an enormous sum of money, certainly enormous by South African standards, and I hope enormous also by your own, some 10 or 15 million United States dollars on his own private homestead at Nkandla became a national scandal. An independent constitutional institution called the Public Protector was called upon to investigate. She found a misappropriation of funds and ordered President Zuma to pay back a portion of the money spent on his private residence. Her report was released, and the first decision in four that our court gave was a decision that entitled the main opposition party to send out a text, to million, a text message to millions of its followers saying that the report of the public protector, quote, shows how Zuma stole your money. The majority judgment in a, wide, in a heavily split court, 7-4, emphasized the vital significance of freedom of expression in protecting democracy by informing citizens, encouraging debate, and enabling folly and misgovernance to be exposed. The issue had not yet played itself out, for President Zuma did not repay any of the money Parliament substituted for the public protector's remedy its own finding that exempted him and exonerated him from any misappropriation. A motion was proposed to remove him as president, and the speaker refused to order a secret ballot. That matter came to our court. The court ruled unanimously that the speaker had the power to order a secret ballot under the rules and the, and the constitutional provisions governing the functioning of parliament. President Zuma narrowly survived the secret ballot that followed. More importantly, the court also ruled in a separate decision, given unanimously by Chief Justice Mukweng Mukweng, that the public protector's order to him to repay part of the money was an enforceable order unless set aside on review by the courts themselves. The fourth and last decision was a decision given just one year ago, again in a dramatically split court. The court ordered the National Assembly to start investigating whether there was a basis for impeaching President Zuma. Chief Justice Mukweng, in dissent, charged that the majority decision was a textbook case of judicial overreach. The charge hasn't stuck either amongst academic critics of the court or amongst the public. Doctrinally, the majority decision was a simple exegesis of the impeachment clause in the Constitution. And just over six weeks later, on 14 February 2008, President Zuma resigned from office. The way he did so deserves some pause. Six weeks before, on the 21st of November 2017, 1,500 kilometers to the north of Pretoria, where he resigned. President Robert Mugabe also resigned. He did so under siege in the presidential home from army tanks with soldiers on the streets under constraint, which had nothing to do with the constitution of Zimbabwe. By contrast, President Zuma's resignation was the culmination of four decisions of our court. It was the apogee of legal and constitutional processes that made it impossible for him to resist the pressure upon him to vacate his office. Thus, the power of legal processes and of judges who are, in, are willing to enforce the powers entrusted to him. Many South Africans were glad to see President Zuma go and have welcomed the integrity and obvious competence that his, that his successor, President Ramaphosa, exudes. The court's sharply defined role in these events has brought it greater credit and enhanced authority. 
That's my second story, my last story, and then I'm going to come to the three non-lessons. My third story goes wider. It explains a different impact of the law. The first was on setting aside irrational governmental decisions. The second was in enforcing accountability in governmental power and in holding of high office. The third explains how the law can liberate minds and secure popular embrace for a vulnerable minority. In 1994, South Africa became the first country anywhere in the world to afford express constitutional protection against unfair discrimination on the ground of sexual orientation. We secured inclusion of that phrase by arguing successfully that protection for a vulnerable and widely despised minority was a test case for the commitment of the Constitution as a whole to anti-discrimination law. In the 23 years since then, the Constitutional Court has given half a dozen decisions vindicating the constitutional rights of LGBTI persons. This included a marriage equality decision, if you'll allow me a second piece of self-indulgent gloating, 10 years before Oberger fell. Thank you for indulging me. That is not my point now, ladies and gentlemen. Those decisions have had obvious practical consequences for LGBTI persons in securing their safety to some extent, though not for lesbians in townships who are still subjected to terror. Just as the constitutional promises have not secured an end to gender subordination or to racism or poverty or inequality, they've also not ended discrimination against LGBTI persons. Yet, the Constitution has had a significantly empowering impact in enforcing a sense of personal agency. I see it when I get letters from young people in the rural areas who write to me at 14 or 15 or 16 to say how proud they are that they are protected by a Constitution that recognizes them as young, emergent, nascent LGBTI people. And this in turn, and here's my real point, has led to a most remarkable shift in public attitudes to sexual orientation and gender identity, one that is entirely unique outside the Americas, Western Europe, and Australasia. In 2013, a Pew Foundation study of global attitudes towards LGBTI people asked a forbidding question. Should society accept homosexuality? An unenticing inquiry to which nevertheless that one third of all South Africans, black and white, rural and urban, answered yes. Through the rest of Africa, Eastern Europe, Asia, South and Central America, and the Middle East, those answering yes constituted almost uniformly less than 5%. A recent South African study revealed even more affirming attitudes. It reported that more than half of South Africans now consider that LGBTI people should have the same human rights as others. And an interesting point is that two-thirds of them were against removing express constitutional protection against discrimination on the ground of sexual orientation. We must bear in mind, in reflecting on these statistics, that most of South Africa's immediate neighbors, Lesotho, Botswana, Swaziland, Zimbabwe, and Namibia, and the rest of Africa, 38 countries, punish consensual private same-sex activity criminally and subject LGBTI people to horrific abuses in the form of beatings, imprisonment, increasing legislative repression, and death. This makes the findings tellingly significant. What is particularly interesting is the disparity between the 50-plus percent who believe that LGBTI people have the right to act as their nature bids them, and the two-thirds who say it should not be removed from the Constitution. It shows, after 25 years of constitutionalism and democracy, what I consider to be an evident sophistication in approach to, right, to rights. It means that a significant proportion of South Africans appreciate that one may consistently resist or reject a moral claim to equality Yet, at the same time, 
believe that those rights should be constitutionally protected. Thus, the transformation, the transformative power of the law. Now, I come to my concluding section. When does that 30-minute banner go up? Not yet? Okay, great. <laughs> I've kept my deal, I, pr I propose to. Why do I tell you these three stories, friends, colleagues, on a wintry morning in the city built by black slave labor, by French settlers, people transported from West Africa, history of French and white settlers and Native Americans. It is because, as I tried to say to Clint yesterday on the flight from Atlanta, that though our countries are so very different, our national struggles have suggesting, suggestive touching points. I do, as I said at the outset, hesitate to suggest that I have any lessons for you. Let me rather suggest three lessons that I take for myself from my own engagement with the law over the last 36 years. First, after practicing as an anti-apartheid lawyer and then as a judge under South Africa's constitution, I remain perplexed by the limitations of the law. But I'm also awed by its power and complexity of both the law and of legal institutions. The law can be cruel and heartless and petty and degrading, but it can also be majestic in its reach, inspiring in what it enables us to achieve and trustworthy in what it delivers. This is a lesson that I know that you cherish and that you pass on in your classrooms. This is a lesson not only of South Africa's engagement with constitutionalism and the rule of law over the last 25 years, but also of Korea's transition from military dictatorship and of Colombia's transition from civil insurrection and war. In both countries, as in South Africa, constitutional courts have played pivotal roles in securing peace and justice and in expanding and expounding rights. South Africa remains a nation deeply divided by class and race, riven by crime and corruption, continuing gender and race discrimination, by extremes of dispossession and poverty, and by state institutions innovated after nine years of calamitous misrule before President Ramaphosa took power. What unites us is often only our belief in our aspirations and in a commitment to realizing them through the values and the mechanisms that our constitution affords. We are a nation defined and distinguished by our commitment to realizing our better aspirations through the law. The National AIDS Program, the decisions exposing malfunction under President Zuma, the widespread acceptance because of the law of LGBTI dignity and equality, quite extraordinary in Africa. These all point to the distinctive authority and power of the law and of constitutional rights when justly and prudently employed. But there's a key condition here, and that relates to my second lesson to myself. If the law is to function, there must be judges who pronounce it, and who pronounce it boldly and honestly. That is a lesson not only the apartheid years, but also our 25 years of democracy have taught. What is an honest judge? It is a judge who has not been appointed to serve a preordained agenda or to secure a predetermined outcome. It is a judge who, notwithstanding inevitable predispositions and attachments and beliefs and political commitments and positions, retains a readiness to be persuaded by argument. It is a judge who resists the temptation to insist in the telling words of Justice David Souter in his 2009 Harvard commencement address that the law is able to provide a world without ambiguity, that it can afford what he called the stability of something unchangeable in human institutions. South African judges, I say with a measure of diffidence, but also with a measure of pride, 
have managed to avoid ideological pre-commitments, and their openness to persuasion has been a pivotal factor in the predominance of law in our democratic functioning. It may also be a pivotal factor in the survival of the rule of law itself. When I think of the hopes invested in my country's constitution and the role played by its judiciary, my mind turns with anguish to Germany's Weimar Republic of just a century ago. That was a noble experiment like our own of enlightenment under law. It ended in catastrophe with hyperinflation and the rise of adult Hitler and the industrial genocide that ensued. The roots of the catastrophe can rightly be traced to the First World War and the Treaty of Versailles, but one of the reasons why the Weimar Republic failed was that too many of its judges were crooks. Some were communists, others were fascists and Nazis. They used their judicial office to promote partisan judicial agendas, regardless of the facts and irrespective of the arguments before them. The tragic failure of law under the Weimar Republic can be laid at the door of crooked judges. In Brazil, where a new president took office yesterday, many see the imprisonment of the man most likely to have won the elections that brought him to office, Mr. Luis Inácio Lula da Silva, as the work of crooked judges. Judges who were predetermined to disable him from standing, regardless of the law. If that proves true, Brazil will pay a heavy price. Naturally, a judge assumes office with preconceptions, experiences, and values, but undertakes with all the fallibilities inherent in that to seek truthful answers to the uncertainties that the law can never eradicate. And here, the important recent intervention of your Chief Justice, Chief Justice Robert, Roberts, comes to mind. We do not have Obama judges or Trump judges, Bush judges or Clinton judges. What we have is an extraordinary group of dedicated judges doing their level best to do equal right to those appearing before them. That is a lesson not only for conservatives, but for liberals in my country. Judges must have a set of guiding values. I have two, a skepticism of power and a determination to protect the weak. Beyond that, I hope my oath to uphold the Constitution and its values suffices as a guide to my decisions and pronouncements as a judge. My third and last lesson to myself, ladies and gentlemen, is never to give up. The institutions of the law may be captured by venal men, and it is mostly men. The instruments it affords may be applied to advance iniquity. Many may fear that the rule of law in your country is under assault right now. In the dark days of apartheid, it seemed unlikely that the law and legal values would survive at all. The sense of peril that many may feel reminds me of the long years of legal struggle when we doubted that the law would survive. Yet Nelson Mandela never, ever, ever lost faith in the law, even when the obduracy of the apartheid government forced him to become a revolutionary, even after he was sentenced to life imprisonment with his people subordinated and humiliated as inferior beings in their own country. Through all this, Mandela kept his belief in the law. He held faith that the law properly applied was an instrument of justice, not injustice, a mechanism for fairness and equality, a means to secure human dignity, not indignity. Even when explaining his decision to defy apartheid's law, he restated his commitment to its values. We must attempt, he said, in one of his most famous addresses, to alter the law. Our faith as lawyers and as law teachers, especially at this time, has to be that the law should be upheld for justice, but not injustice. That the law should be for achieving equality and not entrenching inequality. That its values bend towards social justice and not entrenched injustice. That is a lesson of a special poignancy 
for law teachers, for you carry in your classrooms and seminars the future of your country, as Wendy has said. We must all avoid the lessons of Weimar and of Brazil while nurturing in the new generation their faith in justice. We have to keep on doing that, even in the dark and forbidding times we may feel. That faith kept Mandela through prison, and it will keep us going through these much less dark times. Thank you very much. Thank you, Andy. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Justice Cameron, thank you so much. Um, they, they, they were inspiring words and, and uh, most helpful at these times for us, I think. I'd like to start just by, uh, with a little bit of, of personal background, if you don't mind. Um, I'm, I'm interested in hearing uh, what were for you the, the formative uh, 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 influences that shaped your sense of, of social justice and mm. sent you down the path you went. Wendy, uh, Vicky Jackson last night at our dinner asked me the same question. And, and we, we didn't prove. Pre no, I, I know you were at a different table, but it, <laughs> it's, it's strangely enough not one that I've been asked so directly before. I, I thought about it after Vicky asked me, and I think it, the, the really pivotal thing was not being a, a gay man who knew that I couldn't change my homosexuality in a, in a, in a society that reviled it. I think it was being a poor white kid who came into enormous privilege uh, only because I was white. And that made me see the iniquity of state institutions, but also the opportunity to change them. I think that's what it was. Uh, you, you, as you um, did take your path of, of uh, be being a very active um, activist lawyer, I, you encountered uh, uh, push back from the established bar, and, and I wonder how, how you navigated your, your career, mm. worrying about your career at the same mm. time you were um, an activist. Did you worry about whether you would wind up mm. in prison or where it would take you? Some of my colleagues did, you know, Wendy. I, I, I was threatened with prosecution after the recommendation the Chief Justice uh, at the time, Carl, uh, Pierre Rabi, recommended it. But I must say that I was mostly on the safe side of the law. And some of my colleagues were, were detained or imprisoned. Uh, some of them did braver, much braver things than I did. And of course, the mass of South Africans who secured our liberations did that. Uh, but to answer your question precisely, I, I would say it was almost a sense of headstrong folly that led me to do what I did. Uh, sailors coming out in. Uh, just before I turned 30, uh, a, a realization that I could not do differently, and I made no apology for it after that. Headstrong folly, that, that sounds like uh, the advice we might want to give to uh, some of our students from time to time. I hope um, you'll indulge it. Um, uh, I wonder if you'd talk a little bit about uh, the Center for Applied Legal Studies, yes. uh, because it was, uh, as I understand it, your, your home, um, but was affiliated with the university, and, and our colleagues might be interested to know a little more about that. I, I think it goes back to my main theme this morning, uh, Wendy, that we, we had this enormously sophisticated legal system with lawyers using the law, much as the ACLU and the NAACP did, and, and later the, the National Organization of Women and, and the, the uh, LGBTI organizations. So it, it goes back to, 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 to that sense, and then we had effective law firms, and then in the late 70s, two pivotal organizations were established, one by Arthur Chaskelson, the Legal Resources Center, the other by my other mentor, John Dugard, who formed a university-based center for applied legal studies that you've referred to. So they played a very important role, and the, the significant thing is that they've continued to do that. The Legal Resources Center uh, continues to fight injustice, it continues to fight housing cases, discrimination cases, as does the Center for Applied Legal Studies. 
Anyone who believed that the arrival of the constitution of, of a democratic government would lead to a cessation of injustice was proved completely wrong. So the, 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 the most gratifying thing is that those institutions and the sense of legal assistance to those challenging government misrule, that has endured very strongly. That, that's, that's a precious heritage from the years of, of, of the fight against apartheid. One of the points you, you made in your, in your talk was the, um, the impact of law and, and its significance at, within the fight, uh, the anti-apartheid fight. That said, um, you, you made a personal submission to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in which you argued that all lawyers and judges, whatever their personal beliefs and whatever the extent of their participation were in some way complicit in apartheid. Yeah. And I wonder if you'd expect to elaborate a little on that. I felt that very strongly, uh, Wendy, and it's, 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 I think we all morally stained in some way, and for any of us to uh, set ourselves up as, as, as morally pure is improper. All lawyers under apartheid, the, we, we made a calculated gamble as anti-apartheid lawyers that our work would conduce to the end of apartheid rather than to sustaining it. There were genuine debates and we were very much criticized and I think understandably in the 1980s for legitimating apartheid and legitimating its courts. And yet the answer for me was always in the people who, whether a gay man uh, hounded for, 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 for a sexual exposure in, in a semi-public place, or an ANC fighter uh, accused of treason, they wanted representation. So I was not going to subordinate their need for protection from the law through legal representation to some ideological position resisting it entirely. But it, 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 was, it, was a, it was a defensible position to say that we should all have got out because we were simply le legitimating apartheid. The, and that's what I meant yeah, when I went the, to the, the TRC and I said we were all morally stained by our participation in apartheid. And I, I want to carry it further, Wendy. I, I, I'm fascinated by the debate in, in America at the moment, the bipartisan debate about moving on from excessively long sentences. Were, were you going to come to no, that? No, keep going. I, I, just, I, I want to say that as a judge uh, who holds office under a beautiful constitution, I'm complicit in the degradation of our prison system. We have a very high prison population, 240,000 in a nation of 55 million. It's not the same. I think your prison population is still around about 2 million. It's about 2 million. So your proportionately, it's much worse. But uh, I'm, I'm complicit in the continuing inequalities, poverty. I get a big salary as a judge. That makes me complicit in ways that I was also under apartheid, although I'm no longer complicit in an undemocratic system. I wonder if you'd, you'd talk a, a little about the role of the Truth and Re Reconciliation uh, Commission and, 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 and its impact within South Africa. It's a great question, Wendy, because with the years of, of the Zuma government, a lot of young black South Africans have questioned the Mandela transition and have questioned the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. It was a commission chaired by Archbishop Desmond Tutu, yes. uh, a person of almost equal moral magnitude to President Mandela. And it did wonderful things, but it didn't do enough. The reparations part of the TRC process was never fulfilled. It gave amnesty, mostly to apartheid murderers and, and, and brutal agents, to some uh, ANC and other uh, PAC agents, and it certainly was a forum for remarkable truth-telling, and I don't think we can ever discount the importance of truth-telling. Uh, no white person can ever say that they didn't know what happened because it all came out there in, in, in its horrifying brutality, but it didn't do enough, and uh, that's why we have this quest amongst many young people about the Mandela Constitution, the transition, and what it really did for young black people today. So your reference to truth-telling is, is interesting. I wonder whether um, in your role as a judge, you, you write opinions. Um, for whom do you write your opinions? Do you view that as part of the exercise of, shall we say, truth-telling truth on an ongoing basis? I think so. And I try to be as direct and comprehensible as possible. Uh, 
uh, we, we try, we, we, we've abandoned all legal language. South Africa was a, a, a Latin-based legal system. We, we've, we've expunged that, ex expurgated it from our judgments. And the wish is, of course, law does have obscure technicalities and intricacies that don't make it simple, but you can nevertheless, you should be able to explain, and especially in the country's apex court, you should be able to explain to a group of engaged 16 or 17 year olds what the decision was and why it was given. And that's what I aim to do. Um, you've talk, we've talked a lot about the, um, the South African Constitution and, and its affirmative rights that, mm -hmm. that you talked about in your talk. Uh, housing, health care, food, water, social assistance. But I wonder if you talk about your perception of the role of the court in that, mm. because to the extent that as a court you enforce those rights, yes. you run the risk, mm. so, some would say, of, of, be, of uh, uh, overriding the legislature, of becoming a surrogate legislature in, yeah. in public policy formation. So how do you, as a judge, navigate that? It's, it's a wonderful question, Wendy, because of course it occurred in relation to our constraints upon executive power in relation to President Zuma, where eventually the Chief Justice dissented, calling us uh, classic uh, e exemplars of overreach. And by analogy also in, in, in the region of social and economic rights, we've been somewhat more cautious there. Uh, and we are subject to criticism by progressive lawyers who think that we could have used uh, uh, people like Jackie Dugard and others, that we could have used our powers more interventively and we've struck a balance where we've said the main job of social and economic rights enforcement is government. And if government is failing, there are democratic remedies. And I think that has played off because our, paid off because our political system is now much more complex than it was 25 years ago. There's no longer a gargantuan majority party with an unassailable claim post-liberation to power. It's much more complex because people are aware of government's responsibility and they don't always come to the courts for rescue. So that, the, the, the role of judges uh, br uh, brings me to the point, another point that you made um, about uh, the importance of judges not coming in with a pre-commitment uh, uh, as to how they'll decide cases or a strong ideological uh, pre-commitment. I'm interested just maybe you'd explain the, um, the judicial appointment system mm -hmm, in your mm -hmm. country. Um, and how that functions and, and the extent to which you think that uh, mitigates the possibility of... Uh, it's, it's a system that would seem familiar to, to all Americans. There's a, 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 a constitutional commission called the Judicial Service Commission consisting of between 23 and 25 people, judges, academics, practitioners, and then uh, uh, presidential appointees and parliamentary delegates. And they have an open process. For all judges except in the apex court, the, uh, the appointment has to be made on the recommendation of the Judicial Service Commission. With the Constitutional Court, they give the President a list of four, three more than the number of vacancies. So when I was appointed, in, or when I was recommended in both cases, there was a list of four given to the President. And then the President can choose, but all the candidates have to be vetted uh, for, for appointment. And it's been a remarkable success. I've, I've, I've seen in England where they eventually moved to a judicial appointment process, other than through the Lord Chancellor alone, where they kept the interview secret. There's a downside to it because you risk a lot uh, if you are an unsuccessful candidate who's got a successful commercial practice, say. There are ritual humiliations of some uh, applicants. We're familiar with that. In, yes, in, in exactly. Our system. Uh, I will not be tempted into any recent controversies. <laughs> Fair um, so it, 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 it's a risk, but on the whole, it's, it's been very beneficial because you do wield enormous power as a judge, whether in the High Court or the Appeal Court or the Apex Court. And I think the judicial appointment process should be an open one. Well, I have a, a long list of additional uh, questions, but I know we don't have too much time left, and so I'd like to um, open the floor to um, questions from our audience. Uh, and and I would, uh, uh, people should, uh, you should identify yourself before your question. 
I'm Martha Minow, and I'm uh, uh, from Harvard, and uh, thank you so much, Justice Cameron and Wendy, for this uh, just spectacular discussion. I want to pick up on this issue about the openness of judges but commitments of judges. And it seemed to me um, that this is really the heart of the challenge we have as law teachers. How do we cultivate a sense of commitment but openness? And I was struck by uh, Justice Cameron, your statement that you have only two prior commitments. One is to have a skepticism of power and the other is to have a commitment to protect the, those who are most vulnerable. What's very striking to me is those are very substantive commitments that on many descriptions of the rule of law are absent. Mm. And so I, I really welcome elaboration about that and its relationship to openness. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Mano. That's, that's actually a, a very, very hard question. Uh, if, if I were in your seminar, I'd, I'd be wriggling, and perhaps I am. <laughs> um, they are substantive commitments, but I think you cannot avoid it. You cannot, you cannot avoid having the enormous power that judges, whether in the federal district court or the federal circuit court or, or, the, or the, the high court have. So you have to, and you should be made to account for them. So I think there are, ev every judge has substantive commitments of one form or another. They should be explicit. They should be expressed. That's why I've expressed mine. You cannot deny them. If you deny them, then you are, 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 are not being truthful. And then your question, of course, brings in the question of the rule of law. I, I do believe, uh, and it was implicit in some of what I said, which is that the ordered regulation of human life uh, through impersonal norms and, and directives does imply equality of some sort. Uh, I th and, and one can make that argument uh, uh, at, at a great extent. It does require, I should say that I, I, I'm suspicious of all power, whether it's trade union power, populist power, corporate power, institutional power, or governmental power, and then protecting the weak. Thank you. Hi, I'm Angela Nwachi Willig. I'm at Boston University. Uh, thank you, Justice Cameron, for your very moving and inspiring words. Um, I have a question about um, economic redistribution. I was curious to know, what, uh, redistribution of wealth. I was curious to know whether you think that there can be actual true equality um, without redistribution of wealth. No. And, if, and if your answer is uh, uh, no, um, do you, what role do you think the courts can play in correcting that issue? Wow. <laughs> I, I absolutely refuse to become involved in the debate about reparations for slavery. But I will say that I'm with Ty and Easy Coates on that. But anyway, but to the extent that I can answer your question, um, I don't think there can be. I, don't, I do not think there can be. And, and I... I I was just reading something that some of you will have read about whether our distributional conception of economy, of, of, of equality, is, is an apposite one. I do think that our conception of equality uh, should be something richer and deeper and relational. Uh, but I think that material distribution uh, is, is, an, is an indispensable part of it. I do. Is that too abstract? Do you want to get more practical nitty gritty? Thank you very much. I, th I think both you and Professor Minow have let me off the hook. Thank you. Uh, hi, thank you again for your comments today. Uh, my name is Jacob Willigan-Wachi. I'm at BU, but I'm at Boston University, but I'm not a lawyer or a law professor. Uh, so it, but I was compelled to come uh, hear you speak today. Uh, my question, you talked about the importance of impartial judges. My question to you is, um, what, is a, what is a good process look like for ensuring the selection mm. of impartial judges? Well, I think one can create the institutions for ensuring that, but it, you also have to create the, the, the climate of public discourse that enables that. And it seems to me that, that if, if, if uh, candidates for judicial office deny that they hold substantive preconceptions, substantive pre-commitments, that, that, that that process, however fine it might be, however good the scrutiny might be, the process for scrutiny, that process will fail. 
Uh, I don't know what more one can do. I, I, I do admit with awe and, and with reverence and with caution that the debate in your country has become so polarized that it, it, it's very difficult to, to have a, 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 a productive debate about the nature of impartiality, how you can come, as you inevitably do, to judicial office with uh, moral and, and political pre-commitments, which you nevertheless are, are willing to set to one side with a sense of open-mindedness. That, that presupposes a level of, of subtlety and refinement that does not seem to me to have been present in the recent uh, interviews that, 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 that I viewed. Thank you, Justice Cameron. Susan Karmani, and I'm at the Hamid bin Khalifa University College of Law and Public Policy in Doha. Uh, you talked about other countries in Africa and the challenges dealing with uh, gay rights. And to what extent can the lawyers in South Africa, the emphasis on law that you, you presented today, to what extent can they play a role in building the kind of legal capacity you talked about? And I would also include the judiciary from South Africa. In, in Africa specifically? Yeah, yeah. I, th I think we do. Yeah, I think we do. Uh, in, 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 in Africa, the Kenyan constitution was partly modeled on ours, although it excluded express reference to, to sexual orientation. There's now a judgment pending. The, the young man who brought the case uh, for decriminalization of so sodomy, Eric Guitari, is at Harvard, and I, I spoke to Vicky Jackson about him last night. So there is a court case pending, and I think the South African example uh, has, has been influential in that, both in the equality clause in Kenya and in the notion of an adjudicated uh, 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 strike down of, 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 of uh, criminal prohibitions on same-sex conduct. So it, it's difficult. I, I, I once sat at a dinner in the Malawi State House next to their foreign minister under the administration of President Joyce Banda, who lost the, the ensuing election. And the foreign minister said to me, you went about it the wrong way. You should have changed public attitudes first and then come with your constitutional protection for LGBTIs. I think he's exactly wrong. And I think the facts that I gave this, this, this morning about the Pew Research Institution and the subsequent uh, uh, survey shows it that, 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 that law and constitutional right should lead and I think that is happening. But the most important thing that's happening, I, I, don't, I don't believe that lawyers can do it on their own. That's why I emphasize the importance of popular struggle and popular uprising in South Africa, which has led beneficially to a skepticism about governmental power. If you can defeat the most important, the most powerful government in Africa, you're not going to be humbugged by a transitional government. But I, I must emphasize also in the LGBTI struggle the visibility of black, lesbians, queers, transgender people, gay men across uh, Africa. That, that's, they're out of the bottle. The genie is out of the bottle. And, uh, and, 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 and legal action, test cases, can support them, but it can't supplant them. Mark Wojcik from the John Marshall Law School in Chicago and a former chair of the ALS section on sexual orientation and gender identity issues. Uh, you inspire many people in your country but also around the world. I remember when I first learned about you that there was an openly gay, openly HIV positive judge in the highest court of a country. It was just amazing. Just as Michael Kirby in Australia as well. You've been really inspirational uh, to us. I wonder if there are any cases um, where your sexual orientation or HIV status have, have paid have informed um, your understanding of the arguments made before the court? Yes, th thank, thank you very much for that question. I was in the appeal court a year before the case reached the constitutional court the, the, uh, on gay marriage in 2005. It was brought to us in a form of a challenge to the common law definition, the Roman Dutch common law definition of marriage as a union of, between a man and a woman. The particular couple, two women who had been together for 25 years, weren't connected with any activist groups. It was a most remarkable challenge, so they didn't challenge the statute. So I was, the, the, the president of the court at that time asked me to sit on the panel, and completely rightly, why should straight people sit on the panel determining 
the nature of marriage any more than a, a, a same-sex oriented person. And I believe I really did have an open mind, no more or less open than my other colleagues, about what the development of the common law definition of marriage required under our, was required under our Constitution. So that was very direct. We've had another case in the Constitutional Court, a very interesting case, where after gay marriage was enforced by the, by the Constitutional Court, uh, which required the legislature to legislate equality, the question arose whether the pre-existing court cases for unmarried same-sex oriented people, whether those protections still remained. And our court ruled that they did. So I was involved in that decision as well. But I think you're asking something different. You're asking whether I, as a white gay man, uh, bring my knowledge of privilege, of subordination, of, uh, of, of stigma as a gay man, of stigma as someone living with HIV to my, to my job. And I would say, yes, I do so every day. Thank you. Uh, thank you once again. My, my name is David Mitchell uh, from the University of Missouri. And so my question is, you talked about using the law to sort of get rid of these vestiges of racism or and discrimination and bias. And now we're beginning to see, however, this pushback from those who feel that those laws which help to undo those structures are now infringing upon them. Right? We have a generation now that is fundamentally saying those were our ancestors, not us. You're still a very young democracy. You may not have that generation yet that says those were our ancestors and not us. And so when does the law get to this equilibrium? At what point then do judges in your roles and we dealing with the law get to a point where you can say we still haven't undone what, was, what already existed and how do we address now this pushback of how do we deal with these competing, conflicting individual rights in this context? Well, it, it goes to the very core of, of, of how you see social progress and you see uh, the, 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 the dispersal of, of, of material benefit and of, of political power in society. Uh, I, I certainly see it, and, and this, this would put me at odds with just, uh, Chief Justice John Roberts' uh, decision in, in, in the voting rights case. Uh, to, and, and, and this was expressed very eloquently by Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg in her dissent, that it, it, it is evident that, that, that racism has an accumulated social impact which lives on for generations and for decades and centuries after the end of formal racism. So uh, that, that, that seems evident to me, but you're asking a question that I don't know the answer to. How do you reflect that debate in your conception of the exercise of judicial power? Because if you differ on that, I, 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 I find it hard to credit the notion that, uh, that, that race no longer impacts on, 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 on people's opportunities or development or their internal self-conception or gender self-conception in either your country or in mine. I, I, I find that hard to, to credit, but people do believe that and our challenge is to have that debate uh, while, uh, uh, while using the implements of law to help people to, to help change minds. But I, I'd, again, I've, as with other questioners, I, 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 as I'm uttering these words, I recognize the insufficiency of my answer. Thank you. Steve Ross from Penn State. Um, there's a, a, a older decision, I don't know if, you, if it's a major one in South Africa by Justice Langa uh, in a water rights case where uh, he rejected the claim of a wealthy owner to a breach of human dignity because he had to pay more for his water, yes. but accepted his claim for enforcement of water bills where the authority was simply enforcing water claims against <coughs> white neighborhoods and not black neighborhoods. And I wonder about the human dignity which is expressed in your constitution and has been implicit in ours. Uh, and I'd like to try out a theory and see your response to it. Um, my theory is that North America, both Canada and the United States, have wrestled less successfully with recognition of human dignity than the courts in Germany, Israel, and South Africa. And my hypothesis is that although we have our own share of atrocities against Aboriginal peoples and slavery in the United States, we don't really have a clear conception of what a breach of human dignity looks like. And when a judge like yourself 
considers the breach of human dignity, the classic case is apartheid. And when people come up with claims, you are better able to say, this looks like apartheid, or this looks, for Germans, this looks like the Holocaust, and than, than we have, because we have yet to accept the breaches of human dignity in our own history. And so I wonder if you'd comment on the role of that in, um, and whether you share my view about how human dignity is handled in various constitutional courts. I do, thank you very much, Professor Ross. And, and I think that you're right, that the classic case comes in apartheid, and it's, 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 it's unarguable that the subordinations and deprivations that apartheid inflicted affected people, uh, affected people deeply in their dignity. And that, if, if I may tell an anecdote, which I hope will please some of your audience, Wendy, it's, I, I had the, the great gratification of being in a stand-up fight with Professor Catherine McKinnon, who came to our court, and uh, we were a small group who went to meet her. It was a great honor to meet her. I'd read her work. And she said, why have you linked equality in your, uh, in, in your constitutional jurisprudence to human dignity? And I tried to explain to her, and she uh, interrupted, and she, she, she gave a disposition on why we were so conceptually uh, and intellectually misguided. So I had to set her right. I think it's the only time in, in her travels that she has been set right. But, but that's, that's an egotistical account of, of, of my encounter with her. But of course, it, it's true that you cannot understand the, uh, the, the Constitutional Court of South Africa's approach to equality unless you understand 350 years of apartheid inflicted indignity. And uh, perhaps that goes back to the previous questioner's question about how do you, how do you uh, bring into your conception of legal rights uh, the accumulated subordinations of history. Uh, uh, Justice Cameron, uh, the, the, your reference to our, our history, or your history, uh, calls to mind for me a question that I've wondered about. As you may know, in this country, we're having many discussions about monuments mm -hmm. that, that capture aspects of our history. In Richmond, uh, Virginia. Uh, in Richmond, among other places. Um, I wonder how South Africa has dealt with that. Surely there are monuments uh, to, yeah. to uh, people and events uh, that, that are uh, part of a dishonorable history. And Monuments and street names, yes. Ah, yes. We've, we've had, we've, the, 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 the Zuma years had an, a very complex impact on young people, especially young black people at university, <laughs> because I think the, the specter of a president who appeared, perhaps unjustly, his, his cases are still coming through the courts, to be personifying a, a caricature of, 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 of a certain type of African leader, that led to a, a greater assertiveness amongst many young black people in, in a very complex way. And that led to, after 25 years, perhaps surprisingly so long, to an attack on the statuary, on the, on the place names uh, of, of South Africa. It astonishes me that we still have street names named after apartheid prime ministers. It's taken a long time, and it, to me, it's, it's one of the, one of the uh, it's evidence of the long-suffering forgivingness, and I don't mean to characterize, just there's been a level of tolerance which as, uh, continues to surprise me as a white person. Uh, but it's taken a long time. In your country, it's taken equally long time. But it seems to me the debates have got many strong parallels and uh, I don't believe personally that everything should be torn down. I think there's a, a part in understanding history, uh, uh, but that you should understand that the monument isn't a glorification of a lost system, but that the monument stands there as a reminder of a, a brutally unjust system. I'm Vicki Jackson um, from Harvard, and thank you so much for your uh, wonderful talk. Um, as I reflected on it, I realized what vast knowledge um, was reflected in the talk of constitutional systems in addition to South Africa, uh, which you used to wonderful effect. Um, and I was reminded that 10 or 15 years ago in this country, there was a, a, an astonishingly fierce uh, debate about 
um, whether it was appropriate in constitutional adjudication to uh, acknowledge the experiences of other countries, and I wondered mm -hmm. if you wanted to comment briefly on the benefits or limits of doing so. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, Vicky. We, we, we're very aware of that debate, the debate between Justice Breyer and Justice Kennedy on the one hand and Justice Scalia and other uh, perhaps less silently expressive members of, of your High Court. Uh, our Constitution is very different. It, it permits us uh, in, in, in uh, determining the effect of the Bill of Rights to take account of foreign law and it requires us to take account of international law. And certainly the provenance of our Constitution, which was partly modeled on some of the uh, uh, rights in the American uh, uh, Bill of Rights and on the Canadian uh, Charter of Rights and on the German uh, Grundgesetz. So we, we've, we acknowledge that history and we try to incorporate. I gave a decision on the 20th of December about our refugee protection law and I quoted big chunks of a remarkable decision that your Ninth Circuit gave in November. And the issues were almost, uh, uh, almost identical. The issues of, of, of presidential intervention, of, uh, of, of hostility to refugees, of, the, of, 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 of the, 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 the quest to limit clear, clearly mandated legislative and international law protection. So the issues of, 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 of very similar and I was really proud to be able to, to cite the Ninth Circuit and, and I, I, I honor uh, the judges in your circuit courts who, 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 who produce uh, extremely fine and, and memorable jurisprudence. So I think we're um, getting very close to our, to our, and I see getting nods over there saying we need to um, wrap things up. Ah, my, my, my. Good morning. I'm Jonathan Stubbs from the University of Richmond. Justice Cameron, thank you again for your comments, and Dean Perdue for your leadership in this program. It's been a tremendous program. My question really goes to the rights of women and the impact that the Constitutional Court and your experience has had on the recognition and protection of the rights of women who make up the majority uh, all across the world, and even in this country here, Today, the Speaker of the House we're expecting is going to become a woman. Uh, oh, she's already a woman. She's going to, the Speaker of the House is going to. <laughs> the Speaker of the House <laughs> will be formally installed, and that's uh, Speaker of Pelosi. But also the fact that here, even in this country where we have now a little more than 100 women who are representatives in, in the House of Representatives, in the media it sounds almost as though that's the majority, the, the year of the women. And, and so the perception that what some would see as incremental progress is some massive transformation of social structures is something that's curious, curious to me. And so the impact of law and the protection of human rights, and particularly the rights of women in South Africa, if you'd um, comment on that, I'd appreciate that. Thank you very much, Professor. The the, 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 the most important impact of the Constitutional Court has actually been on traditional law. The Constitution preserved the Roman Dutch common law and it preserved African traditional law which had not previously been formally recognized in the South African legal system. Although it's the law that governs still about a third of our population in, in, in the rural areas. And our court has given a number of significant decisions that enable women to become uh, 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 traditional leaders uh, monarchs of, of, of their traditional communities. The big test lies ahead because for very complex reasons the governing ANC adopted the whole uh, Bantustan hierarchy in its own exercise of power. And the question now which will come to our court, uh, it may come before my own term limit kicks in in the next year or so, uh, and therefore I don't express any view on it of course. Uh, is, is, is whether uh, women in, tr in rural areas enjoy uh, tenure rights. Because those tenure rights are located in the traditional leaders who are overwhelmingly men, as you say. So that question remains for decision. But our court has done a great deal. And again, like with LGBTI people, like with, with, with uh, racial stigma, I think the law has a very, very informative and enlightening and even ennobling role to play in changing self-conceptions as well as 
other conceptions in regard to gender, race, and sexual orientation, and infection with HIV. Thank you. So uh, again, Justice Cameron, thank you so much for, you, so for much. making the long trip here and, and sharing your thoughts. Oh, I'm very, thank very you grateful. So much. Thank you.